Welcome back to The Laura Show. I have a special guest with me today. I always say special guest because everyone is so special, but this one is actually my very own family, and I'm so excited to have Melanie LaBelle Tushi, which happens to be my maiden name, with me. Thanks so much for making the trek. You, Thank you, you for came. having me. <laughs> you came all the way from Burlington today, so I, I know did. that can be a, a long haul. Um, you know, I've known you since I, we were both 18, I think, when we first met each other. Uh, we were in first year university together. We met on campus. We were in the same residence, essentially, and you happened to uh, become quite good friends with a friend of mine from the ski club, Courtney, who... Mm -hmm. Shout out to Courtney, it was just her birthday the other day. Well, it was just your birthday the other day too. So happy birthday to all you July babies. Um, and I don't know what it was, at least from my perspective. I always tell everybody the first time I met you, I just thought you were like the coolest person that I ever knew. I don't know if it was because you were giving me such Toronto vibes and I was just like this you know, suburban girl from Brampton who didn't know my head from my ass. Certainly from a fashion perspective, had no clue. And the first time I think I went out with you, I just remember your outfit. You were wearing a hat, you had the skirt and these boots. And I was like, oh my God, this per like, you're sh I need to know this person. She's just so cool. <laughs> so I don't think I've ever even told you that, but now you know. <laughs> and I was like, she's going to be my friend. Little did I know though at that time, once I introduced you to my boyfriend and all of his friends, which includes my brother, who is now your husband, he was probably thinking at the same time, I need to know this chick and I need to, I need to be friends with her. So we both probably, I guess the two she's like you. What I can know, I say? It's just giving off. Things. You were giving off like two she's <laughs> love me vibes. So uh, yeah, so for you guys watching and listening, um, known you, I guess, for what is that, 20 years, mm -hmm. essentially, we've really, um, you know, come into our own together, I would say. Like, we've, we were kids when we met, and now we're adults. And it's been quite, quite a journey. Not only are we just adults, you are a mother, you are a wife, obviously a, a daughter and, and a sister, but um, a mom of two little girls, Isla and Hendry, who <laughs> are the, my, the, the cutest little nieces. But I mean, I guess I'm biased, but I love them to death. And, uh, and, uh, and you're a great mother, so kudos to you. Um, so let's get into it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Why I brought you on here is is a couple reasons, but the first kind of thing I wanted to talk to you about is to take us back like a couple weeks ago and maybe you can kind of just tell us the story because essentially what I want the viewers and listeners to gain from today is around advocating for yourself. And whether that be in your career, whether that be when it comes to health, obviously your story is, is more health related, but I think it's a good lesson for everybody in every avenue of their life. Maybe I can just give some context about you. Sure. Can you tell us mm -hmm. what you used to, like now you're a full-time mom. Mm -hmm. What did you used to do before? Yes, so before coming out of university, um, I went right into the path of recruitment. I just actually fell into it. It wasn't like I was like, this is what I want to do. Um, I don't even know if anybody says that. About it's like real estate. No one says that. <laughs> no, no one says that. <laughs> you kind of just fall in, into yeah. it. Yeah. But prior to that, I actually, um, I have a strong work ethic and I started working before I was even allowed to, before I even had a SIN number. Mm -hmm. I think I was like 15 and I was on the cusp and I begged a spree clothing to actually hire me. Um, was in like, you know, uh, retail for the, the longest time, better part of like sort of my high school and university years. And then came out of it, sales is like, you can, it opens up so many doors, right? Like real estate, so much. Um, and then I just, I had a, I was poached. I had a recruitment firm poach me. I was working for a golf company prior to that. I was doing sales for them, um, which again, I just sort of fell into through a connection. And then I went to recruitment. I was in recruitment for, ooh, like almost coming up on, I want to say like seven, seven, eight years. Um, and then that ended abruptly. Abruptly, because <laughs> because I had I had yeah. children. Yeah, and um, it was my decision. Actually, I knew for the longest time if I was going to have kids that I wanted to be a full time mom. And actually, at the beginning, before even um, knowing, I, I didn't even know if I wanted kids, and there was all that back and forth and all these co internal conversations, right? So you had that, and then all of a sudden you have your kid, and then you you go on maternity leave and you need to start thinking about going back to work. And that was such a hard struggle for me because I really didn't want to go back, but financially, me and my husband, it was something that I had to do. We mm -hmm. knew we had to do that. 
Um, and when I did, uh, fortunately, I actually got sick again for the second time. First time, I had awful pregnancy. Second time, awful. I had to go on uh, disability, um, so that that wasn't great. But it sort of steered me. It kept all these signs kept steering me mm. into that into that direction of being a full time mom. And you know, I've I've been doing that since yeah, the last seven years. So. So it's funny that, like, I never really thought of it as sales, but of course you were in sales. Like, I get, mm. I just, just kind of looked at recruitment, like recruitment in and of itself. But it's so funny, you're such a good salesperson. And when I think of you, one of, one of the attributes that I've always admired in you is your phone ability. Like, I, I tell everybody all the time how much I hate the phones. Like, it's been a phobia of mine since I was a kid. So why I landed in sales is kind of unbeknownst to me, but you are the type of person like you pick up a phone, you'll call like Bell or Rogers and you're like, I will sit on this phone and I will have a conversation with whoever I can get a hold of and whoever's gonna listen and I will some way figure out a way to <laughs> finagle my price down. Like you're such a great negotiator and it's such a strong, yeah. strong skill set of mine, uh, of yours, not of mine. <laughs> um, which is why I think it's so funny with what happened from the health perspective. I feel like that's just such a quality of yours that in this story, um, mm. it kind of comes out and you kind of see it. And I feel like in a similar circumstance, I wouldn't have behaved the same. So I'm hoping that you can take us to, you know, before obviously what happened and why you ended up in the hospital. Maybe you can shed some light on on the procedure and everything and, mm -hmm. and why you ended up where you were. Sure, sure. So just to give like sort of a quick backstory, um, for the better part of my adult life, I suffered from GI issues. and. Those GI issues, I think, uh, well, now, fast forward to now, I know that they're related to certain things that I ingest, certain um, sort of food sensitivities that I have, but at the time, I wasn't really piecing all that together. Mm -hmm. And also, being a female going into the workforce, um, I don't know if you experienced this or if anybody else has experienced this, but going to the bathroom was actually a fear for me. <laughs> like you talk about the phone oh, thing, God. so going to the bathroom yes. was my, was yes. my fear yes. because I was so determined to do such a good job in you know coming out and having my first job. It was like I cannot screw anything up. Mm -hmm. I have to you know use. I, I don't want to use my. Um, my boss's time by me going to the bathroom. It's such a crazy thing to think, right? Everybody goes to yes. the bathroom. Yes. But I was so fearful. And I worked in a place actually of all females, believe it or not. Um, there was not a single. Did that feel like more. particularly competitive, maybe? Very yeah. competitive. Okay. Very, very competitive. And I think it was that competitiveness that I saw. I don't, I don't even know if I saw anybody leave and go to the bathroom or anybody in the bathroom. And I just, I, I had a fear from that. And also, Going, I don't know if I can say this on you can't camera. Say I can anything. say anything. We're gonna, we're gonna go swear personal. You you want. <laughs> <laughs> but like going number two, having yes. a bowel movement. Yeah. Right? You don't want to be in there and doing that. Like women don't do that. You know, right? It's kind of we all know. Like, like I when I worked at Holt Renfrew, I had really bad IBS at that time, mm. and I like the amount of stress that that caused because you'd eat the smallest thing and you'd have a situation. Right. And I. Even when I was in high school, I wouldn't even go number one if someone was in the bathroom with me. Like I've obviously outgrown that a little bit because mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you got to get on with life. But like had the same thing. I'd be so stressed. I would literally like go up and down stairwells to try to find bathrooms on other floors with no one in them. That, that probably took 15 <laughs> minutes. Like it's so so stressful. We're yes. literally you're almost in tears holding it so badly. And so yes, and that and an unfortunate part of that is that doesn't help. The, the situation. It doesn't. Yeah. No, and it's an awful way to think. And we're, I mean, we're our own worst enemy and we're thinking all of these things that, uh, you know, it, it's so taboo or what is, you know, what's my colleague going to think? And it's yeah. awful, right? Everybody has to go to the bathroom and really at the end of the day, it can cause very severe health issues. And for me, I was having a lot of bloating because I was holding everything in. I was holding my bowel movements in. I wasn't going to the bathroom. So that started, like we're talking, you know, early, to, early yeah. to mid twenties, right? Um, and that uh, grew and grew and grew. And so going to the bathroom for me, it was like getting, get out. So, you know, now we're talking about straining. You're talking yeah. about being really quick on the toilet, not listening to your body, those kinds of things. Trying to get it all done before you even go to work. Absolutely. Or, or, exactly. or waiting until the end of day. <laughs> exactly. You, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. And that's exactly what I would do. And so what that started to do, it snowballed into me having 
early onset of hemorrhoids. Mm -hmm. And hemorrhoids, when a lot of people think of them, either you're in your older age, right, elderly, or maybe you're postpartum, so a lot of women yeah. experience it post-childbirth. And for me, here I am, you know, in my 20s with hemorrhoids. And at the time, they weren't, they weren't as severe as, as they got to. Um, but they, it, it was a struggle for me. So basically, it certainly affected the quality of your life. Absolutely. Right? Like absolutely. I remember countless times, I mean, it, I hope you don't mind me saying, like you guys ended up giving it a pet name, you and Brandon, because right. it'd be like <laughs> this kind of thing that was like always with us. You know, That's right. it was like, if we go on vacation, it's like, it's there, like all, always kind of hanging out with me. And That's I, right. And, and it, it does start to become- Derek. Yeah. Derek, okay, I, was, I wasn't gonna out the name, <laughs> okay. but the name of the hemorrhoid for some reason is Derek. And, um, yeah, it really does start to impact you, right? Because it impacts how much fun you can have because mm -hmm. you know that if you're going out with friends, for example, and say there's drinking or there's certain types of foods, you know that those foods exacerbate the issue, right? Yes. So it, it, take, it robs you of things that you would have previously enjoyed because now you're just constantly trying to manage it, I suppose, Absolutely, right? absolutely. And that's, re that's really hard at, at that age. I mean, at any age, but... Um, you know, you're living your life, you're moving, you're in, the, you're in the fast lane and there's no time to sort of sit at home and tend to this chronic issue over and over and over again, right? I know there's a lot of people have chronic issues and, and my hat's off to them. Um, but yeah, this was just, it was really holding me back. So I started searching and I'm not afraid to speak about my um, health issues. I'm a pretty open book when it comes to that. I'm much more open book now for, for reasons which you'll soon find out. Um, but I'm, you know, pretty connected to, to internally to everything that's going on, and I follow both conventional but also holistic, mm -hmm. um, naturopathic avenues as well. So I kind of I did everything, you name it. I did creams, I did over the counter, I did prescription stuff, everything you could think of, aside from going to the extreme at that time because I hadn't had kids so yet. So I ended up visiting um, a clinic that specializes colon clinic. They do colonoscopies, but they also specialize everything in and around that region okay. internally. And at the time, they basically said, you know, this is gonna be something that's chronic for you, but if you're gonna have kids, in order to go to the extreme of either a hemorrhoidectomy, which is completely removing the hemorrhoid, or banding, you probably don't want to do that right now because it's just gonna come back. Right, because right? once you have kids, it's gonna, cause the whole thing over again. So only put exactly. yourself through that maybe once when you feel you're done having kids. Exactly. Can exactly. you explain to people, I don't know if you can, but like to the best of your ability what a hemorrhoid really is? Because I actually think there's a lot of confusion about what it is. Sure, sure. So I'm not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I've spent so much of my life yeah, But you spent so much this. time with Derek, so, <laughs> so I feel time. like you know him intimately. Oh, we're close. <laughs> um, basically, so everybody has hemorrhoids. They are, they're your internal rectal blood vessels, right? And those, when those get swollen and um, exasperated, they, they start to swell and they fill with blood. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you can either have an internal hemorrhoid or you can, so that would be internally. Um, I don't know if, you can feel it. You probably can feel it a lot if you're having a bowel movement. It, it depends on the size of the hemorrhoid. Yeah. But then also that hemorrhoid can come out. Right. Right. Um, and that's just simply because it's swollen so much that it's exited. So much that it's just, it's popped okay. out, right? Gotcha. Um, bearing down, foods you're eating, right? Diet, all of that. It's all related to what's coming through there, which is your bowel movements. Which is, you know, the other thing just to make note, it's like you can't stop eating, right? right? To let something heal. So that's the unfortunate part with something like this. Like if you have a scab or something, like just don't pick it. Like, but you have to continue to feed yourself. And it's not like, oh, starve yourself for a day and it goes away. Exactly. Like it doesn't work like that. And you, you have to just continue to do it. And, but then you keep irritating it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very hard to like let that heal naturally, I feel. Oh, definitely. And around the clock at times I would be doing, like sits baths are very good for it, um, soaking in the bathtub, all the different things multiple times a day after every bowel movement, you actually are supposed to use the creams or you're supposed to, you're, I did go to cold sticks, which oh. you would insert oh. and that would reduce the that swelling. kind of nice. Oh, it, it was. <laughs> Um, but basically, that's you have to be at home. You have yes. you you can't leave, right? You're basically what are you gonna do? A what, prisoner. Like, you said being at the office. Can you imagine like leave? Sorry, I gotta leave this meeting and grab my purse. Like I mean, it's bad enough when you're on your period trying right? to like hide stuff, trying to hide all, all of that. Yes. yes, yeah. So I, I live with that, and a lot of times, and and I got to understand my body in terms of also 
what I was ingesting at the time. But you have one little slip up, right? Mm. You go out and eat, you have a night out, you know, we all know, we've all been there. And then all of a sudden you're back to square one. And unfortunately, my GI system is super, super sensitive that I soon, I found out mm -hmm. um, in, in the later part of my life. And so, yeah, you have to, you have to follow all these things. So basically, that's what got me to um, the point of, of what I'm about to speak about, something very personal and something that happened um, about eight weeks ago now, yesterday was my Are we yeah. at eight weeks now? Eight weeks okay. already. So I had a life change, well, life threatening uh, medical emergency that was as a result of my simple, I mean, I say simple because a hemorrhoid, a lot of people deal with them, like over 50% of the population are going to experience hemorrhoids at some point. They say even 70% of Canadians at some point mm. are going to have a hemorrhoid, right? So there's a lot of people, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of listeners right now are probably nodding their yes. head going, yes. Yeah. And this is not just females, by the yeah. way. This is yeah. both males and females. I, I do think we tend to That's attribute true. it to more to, to women because like of childbirth and, and all that as well. But yeah, it's, yes. it's pretty common. It's, it's very common. So post kids, I said enough is enough. I was having this past year, it was getting really, really bad and it was affecting my, my daily living. So I looked into options and I went in headstrong and I wanted a hemorrhoidectomy. And basically I got like a no, flat out no. This is a very risky procedure for somebody of my age. Did they remove part of the colon? Or just the hemorrhoid? Just the hemorrhoid okay. itself, they go in there, but because my, it's my understanding that the area is so sensitive, it's your rectum, that if anything um, goes wrong, mm -hmm. right, the risks of it are so so great that you can have like incontinence for the rest of your life, Jeez. right? And for somebody who's in an older age that might have extreme hemorrhoids, right? Like well, I'm talking a prolapse hemorrhoid that's so massive, they were talking to, this right. is the example they were yeah. giving me. Mine wasn't there. I, I did have an external hemorrhoid that was coming in and out every week, basically, yeah. that I was dealing with. And to me, like it, it's not huge, but you feel it. It's so sensational. It, ha it has so many nerve, nerve endings, endings yeah. that you're like, you're waddling, right? You're like this, like wanting like <laughs> I mean, all like, over the place. Like my hemorrhoid, I can't right? walk. Yeah. And I have two kids, four and six, yeah. and I'm running around. I'm a busy mom, right? And I'm constantly in pain. So I felt like I was reaching for the Tylenol and ibuprofen every day just to get me through the day. And that's not a, a way of life, right? So no hemorrhoidectomy, but my other option was hemorrhoid banding. So what's that? So hemorrhoid banding is minor procedure. You're completely awake. You go in and they go in with a scope not very far up because the hemorrhoid is not that far. And they essentially take like a hair elastic. Mm -hmm. I was picturing like the braces elastic. The braces. Yeah, it's probably, okay, it's not a hair elastic. Okay, we're talking so <laughs> like big. A little tiny You're right. That's yeah. a better analogy. So it's like, um, who knows? Maybe it is the braces elastic. <laughs> <laughs> like, very tiny elastic. Obviously, your hemorrhoid in that area is, is pretty small. Um, but they're going up above the dente line. So they're essentially placing it so that you're not going to feel it. You're, okay. uh, the dente line, is, below is, the dente line, right. if you're, what you're feeling above it, you're not, right? Because you don't have any nerve endings above it. You don't have any nerve endings above it. And they yeah. obviously don't want you to be sitting in excruciating pain. The band doesn't go on and it's not like all of a sudden surgery's done, um, life like procedure's done, life yeah. is good, right? That band has to start to cut off the circulation of the hemorrhoid. And eventually the goal is then it's going to pull that hemorrhoid off and, and you're going to have the hemorrhoid removed. Right. Right. And then and my, my guess goal. is it could come back, but it's at Absolutely. least it, it's, it's a solution that can work for maybe a couple years. Maybe. Exactly. Yes. And also too, I got to a point where I was understanding my diet and I was adding in a lot of fiber. Mm -hmm. That's what I was missing before. Right. Believe it or not, I'm, I'm like an advocate for this now, but you need so much fiber in your diet to have a good solid bowel movement. Yeah. Everybody needs a good bowel movement. Yes. Right. But we all know the difference between a good day and a bad day. <laughs> we know, yeah. So for me, I guess I just need a lot more fiber and it's taken me till now to, to learn that. that. So yeah. having the hemorrhoid removed through the banding, I was able to kind of have a clean slate. Okay, my cluster of hemorrhoids, because I did have three that were banded, mm -hmm. um, would hopefully be removed and then I could, no, I'm starting from scratch is essentially in my mind of, of what I'm thinking, right. right? So here we are at the beginning of May and I go in for that banding procedure. And immediately when the band went on, I felt something, like instantly. Even, and though you weren't supposed to feel something. I wasn't supposed to okay. feel something. I mentioned this to the doctor who did the procedure. His response was, you're gonna, you might feel a little bit of discomfort, but go home, take Tylenol, take ibuprofen, it'll manage it, you'll be fine. Probably within you know, a day or so, that'll subside. Okay. That didn't happen for me. So that week, I was in a lot of pain. And also, you don't know how much pain 
your your uh, pain tolerance is, right? How much is too much? What is he saying? Is it is this little? Is this you know where where am I on the spectrum, right? Right. Am I calling this a ten when really everyone else considers this a two? Whatever. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I get it. Um, so yeah. So basically, that week I was in a lot of pain, not to the extent that I that I eventually got to, but very uncomfortable. At the end of that week, I had a um, hemorrhoid that ended up popping out. So when I went in for the procedure, I didn't have anything that was hanging out. Mm. At the end of the week, something did end up popping out just out of the blue and it didn't feel good. So I went back to the clinic mm -hmm. and I saw the doctor and he did, he went in and he said, I don't see anything suspicious. I think you're good. I actually don't even know if the bands are still on because you're kind of watching oh, for the okay. bands also or they say that you can see they it come would out. They come, come, come out. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So nothing. Go home, take more Tylenol, ibuprofen. So I go home, we do that. Tylenol and ibuprofen. Tylenol and okay. ibuprofen, which soon, later, that'll, that'll come up. But um, so I go home and continue that. Did that for a few days. Now I'm in a lot of pain. This is in the second week. Started the second week, um, like we were probably at a five or six before. Now I'm like a nine, nine verging on a 10. Um, and my husband was away. I was with the kids. Called my parents. Had them come over. You're kind of like, when do yeah, I sound Yeah, you're at a nine. You do? can't. You're not functioning. You're not really functioning, yeah. right? Um, so I say I'm going to drive myself to the hospital. So I go to the hospital. That was on the Thursday. And you're waiting through triage, everything. You get in, see the doctor. Doctor tells me that I've got a thrombosed hemorrhoid because okay. the hemorrhoid is out. Thrombosed hemorrhoid. It means that there's a blood clot in the hemorrhoid. Okay. And essentially, they can actually stick something, stick a needle in and remove that blood clot only if the blood clot is filling up the entire hemorrhoid. In my case, it wasn't. I begged for them. I said, please, just help do me. Anything, like, do right? anything to relieve this. They said, well, we can't do that, but we can put you on pain meds. Let's get you on more meds, send you home. So at that point, I hear him like... <sighs> You're, you're having this internal battle with yourself. You're kind of going, well, I've, I've already been back to the clinic. Now I've taken myself to the eMERGE. Surely they're going to do something mm -hmm. for me. Like, we're, we're going to get this figured out. No, you're just going to go on T3s. Um, yeah. So you kind of have to, at that moment, I'm like, i got to trust the system. I have to just, okay, I'm going to trust the system. I'm going to go home. This is going to resolve itself. I just, maybe another few days of this, I can I can. And you're probably thinking, well, I'm not a doctor. Right. So it's something, they must see this all the time. So I guess I'll just trust what they're saying. And exactly. Go along with it, right. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. So we go home, get the T threes filled, st start on the T threes. This is now going into Victoria Day weekend, our mm -hmm. long weekend. Um, and on the T threes, they're helping. It's manageable. They're taking the edge off, but it's it's there. The pain is there, and it's you know it's getting it's increasingly getting worse, getting worse, getting worse. So Sunday, here I am trying to run around, be um, champion mother of the day while I'm waddling and on the T3s, trying to like do laundry, thinking I haven't watered my plants in weeks, I've neglected those, I'm gonna water my plants, um, I'm gonna to tend to my children. And my husband looks at me, your brother, and he goes, I'm gonna take the kids out. You need to just relax, Yeah. right? So he's getting the kids ready, he's getting them in the car, and um, my daughter, my, our, my youngest daughter, she was sick that week. And when she gets sick with like a cold, she gets very flummy, I'm sure a lot of people know this with kids, but when they get, um, upset and they start coughing, it actually turns into vomiting. Mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing. Yes. It's awful. Um, but it's just, it's, it's, it's just common. It's yeah, just common. So you just deal with it. So, um, so he takes, he, he takes the kids out to the car, but of course my eldest starts razzing the, the little one mm -hmm. and gets her going and she starts throwing up and my husband, um, gets her out of the car and now we've got a mess, but fortunately he didn't leave our house that day because when I was uh, walking back into the house to get the paper towel, I felt like a gush come out of my rectum. Now, a little bit of tidbit of information, I had actually started my menstrual cycle that weekend at the same time. Right. So we're not like, at the, at the moment, I'm like, what, <laughs> what is this? What, <laughs> what end is this coming out of? But everybody, everybody has a good sense. You know, you know where you know, it's coming well, from. You know well, things are happening. So yeah. obviously I panicked and I knew something, something was up. So I got myself to the bathroom and um, blood is coming out of like, my rectum. Like, are we talking like, like a faucet of blood? Like a faucet that you turned on and then like it came out and then it, it, and it turned okay. off. But a good amount. Okay. Like as if you had urinated. Okay. It, that is a good amount. Yeah. So that's alarming. It's alarming because if you've never had, I mean, I, I had never had blood 
kind of, you know, pouring out of your rectum before. I mean, I've had, I, having hemorrhoids, you know, and people probably know, you wipe yeah. and you get a little bit yeah. on the tissue. Um, also, just to make note, from your hemorrhoid banding, you do sign a waiver. And in the waiver, it does say you can experience these risks. And one of them is you can have bleeding. But they don't ever say how much bleeding. You mm. kind of assume if you are a hemorrhoid sufferer that there's going to be a little bit of blood. Right. So you don't know what's happening. Right. This is they a don't lot. tell you if it's a tap. Of they don't blood. tell you if right. it's a tap. So I panicked. And I think just my whole imbalance, blood pressure, everything went crazy. I sort of was starting to fade. I got to the garage and my husband was in the garage cleaning up. And I said, call 911. Mm. And he thought it was for our daughter. He came running in and... He found me on the floor. My two kids, unfortunately, were there, so they witnessed mommy, you know, um, being in that situation. They were sitting beside me, and I was in and out of um, sort of, you know, you go into like that tunnel vision where you can kind of hear, but it feels like you're a little bit in a fishbowl. So I was just holding on. Um, so I was lying there, and he called 911, and then the paramedics came, and at that moment, I heard them saying where they were going to take me. Mm -hmm. At that moment, I stuck up and said, no, I want to go to this hospital and I knew I had a feeling that this was the hospital I was supposed to go to it was actually the hospital that I took myself to on the Thursday it's a hospital that is close to where we live I'm comfortable why with would it. they have even wanted to take you to a different hospital so there's two hospitals in the area where I live um, and you don't know you just okay. I, I don't know they just because it wasn't closer there. the other one exactly okay. I don't know exactly but I had a feeling I had a feeling and that and, and my feeling was was a good one obviously um, but that's where, that's where they took me. So here I am in triage. I'm waiting for my husband because he obviously had to get my kids settled. Mm -hmm. um, and he gets there. We're still waiting, and I get the same sensation coming. So mm -hmm. I haven't bled at all from the time that I had bled at home. So, so it had stopped. Now I'm at home, and or sorry, I'm at the hospital, and uh, I go to the bathroom, and more blood is coming out. And this time, it was very alarming. Like, there's... What, what now I know are clots Sorry, coming out. Like, I, I know what I know, you're going to say, so I'm like, oh. it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's pretty graphic. Yeah. Um, the door's open so people can see because my husband is completely panicked. Right. And he's calling for nurses or a doctor to come. A nurse comes and assures me that you can lose a lot of blood right. and you're okay. So after they even saw what had happened, they were like, it's okay. It's okay. It's I, I, I don't know if they're trying to calm you down because they don't, they don't actually know what's going on. Right. Nobody had taken any blood work from me at that point. Right. So nobody knows, but I think they're just trying to say something to calm right. you down. Right. I don't know. Okay, fair, fair. Right. Um, which I, 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 don't, I don't discredit the fact that you can probably use, lose a lot of blood and, and be okay, right? Our, our bodies do ha have a lot in, in them. So at that moment, um, they got me on a stretcher and I'm hooked up to IVs and they're starting to do blood work. So they do the blood work. My hemoglobin was 133 at the time, and it had dropped. So it had shown a drop from 133 down to 122. Mm -hmm. They're not alarmed, but they're just um, monitoring the situation. So I'm on a stretcher, and I'm actually hanging out in the hallway in Emerge, so not in a specific room. Um, but I'm feeling, okay, like a little bit more at ease. I think they know what they're doing. Yeah. This is under control. We're gonna get this figured out. Um, at that time, I, again, I'm going to be pretty graphic, but I was passing a lot of gas. Okay. And this is like a big telltale sign. And at the time, we didn't know what was going on. So I'm under blankets. You're supposed to be masked in the hospital. Oh, yeah. So I have a mask. Yeah. My husband has a mask. He's sitting kind of far away from the stretcher, like a good distance. We're in an open hallway. And he can't even believe what he's oh, smelling and, and, and what I'm smelling. <laughs> oh, my it's, God. It's so awful. It's like rotten. It's so I, rotten, I get the feeling, right? Yeah. Um, sorry, sorry, guys. <laughs> sorry. It is, it is what it is. Yeah. It is what it is. But at that time, you don't know what's going on. But you do know that blood has come out through your rectum yeah. and you're passing gas. And that's through your colon and your yeah. rectum. And you're thinking, what is going on here? And you're trying to be a doctor in your own head. You're trying yeah. to dissect this. You're trying to understand your body. You're lying there. You're just waiting to be seen, right? Um, and my husband's going, I think it's your IV. I think like your IV's doing that. And I've had enough IVs to know. Like, that's not. <laughs> I didn't tell him at the time, but I was like, <laughs> that, that's no IV. So Emerge Doctor comes, we get seen. She does um, her examination. And now I'm getting contradictory information because she's saying I don't actually have a thrombosed hemorrhoid. I just have a regular hemorrhoid. Maybe I did at one point. But she's not alarmed. And she's looking at my vitals and my vitals are stable. And she doesn't know where to go with that. And she wants to send me home. She wants to discharge me.
So she says, you, you're fine. You're Everything's fine. Gonna be Everything's fine. fine. I don't see anything that is alarming here. So she says, I, I'm going to discharge you. She says, I'm going to discharge you. And what happens in your mind at this point? Well, because again, it's like a doctor telling you I'm letting you go. So you're like, well, I guess. Right. So you have, you, you have a bit of a battle. You have somebody over here who's a person of authority, right? They're professional. They're a doctor. They know what they're doing, right? And then you have that internal voice that's going, wait a second. Something is not right. I just know deep down inside, I'm listening to that little voice. This is not right. I've been in these little, these little moments along the way for the last two weeks where for some reason nobody's, nobody's been really listening, nobody can put their finger on it, nobody knows what actually is going on. And here I am, I'm, I'm excreting blood through my rectum, like a good, decent amount, and there is no, nobody's giving me a reason. And how can I, how can I leave home. the hospital with that? So and what do you say? What do you say to her? Well, um, to your point about me being strong-willed <laughs> and not afraid to Because <laughs> I probably, this mind. is where I think I would have been like, okay. Well, you, you know, because like, right. It's the doctor. Like you always think, just trust the doctor. But I feel like you have such a good intuition about yourself. Mm -hmm. So what do you say to her? You challenge it and you say, no, I am not going home. You are not sending me home. I'm not going anywhere. You need to find somebody else to consult with. And I looked her dead in the eye and that's what I said. I, she must have I been so a bit sure. taken aback. I'm sure oh, she, she was. hear that every day. Oh, she was. Yeah. She, she was. She paused. I don't think she, she knew exactly what to do in that moment. Um, which is why she said I'm going to, she didn't say I'm going to remove myself, but she said I'm going to go look, see what other resources we have. Mm. Okay. So that's what she did. So she trolley, trolleys off. She trolleys off. So <laughs> this is, this is Sunday yep. of the long weekend, yep. right? So staff I'm sure is pretty, is probably short. I know is short. Um, and so she goes off here. We are, we're waiting a little bit longer. She comes back and she says, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is that I have an on-call emergency surgeon. They are doing a, a procedure right now. The bad news is, is that you're going to have to wait for the surgeon to come look at you. For the surgeon to come look at okay. you. Well, here I am. I've been waiting for probably a good 12, 12 plus hours. Waiting is, is not my issue right now. My issue is getting to the bottom of, of what's wrong, right? Yeah. So I look at her. I said, great. We're going to take the option of staying. We're going to, we're going to see the surgeon. That's, that's what we're here to do. Okay. So here we are. We're waiting again, waiting quite a bit longer, but that's fine. Um, no more blood's coming at, at this moment. Still a lot of gas. Surgeon comes down and she does a, does a scope and, and looks at me, a little, a, a sort of a small scope. Again, she doesn't know what to make of it, but there's something that's more, I, I'm more confident mm -hmm. in, in what she's telling me. She's, she's just puzzled and she's not sure and she wants to look further. So again, she says, I'm gonna go and see what other resources we have. She leaves, comes back. She says, you know what? I don't know what's going on. This is, this is strange, but something's not right. But I'm gonna give you the option. So again, I'm faced with the option. You can either go home, it's up to you. She doesn't really paint a sort of a pretty picture of staying, mm. or you can stay. And of course- You picked stay. I picked stay, yeah, I picked stay. So I remember the Monday morning, you know, my brother calls me and he's, or my parents call me and they're like, oh, Melanie's in the hospital and you've been in the hospital a bit. So I'm like, okay, and I'm like, for the hemorrhoid? Like, they're like, yeah, like they, you know, there's some bleeding, but like, just like the doctors are probably saying like, well, they don't know when it's not so bad, right? Right. Obviously you spent the whole night at the hospital and I'm just gonna kind of fast forward okay. us kind of through through the Monday a little bit. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until later, I was literally like about to go to, not to bed, but like to like get ready to start going to bed. Mm -hmm. And I thought I should message my brother cause he's probably still at the hospital. And that's when I get a phone call from Brandon. Mm -hmm. And Brandon is in tears and my brother is not in tears often. And he's almost hyperventilating. And he's like, you need to get to the hospital. I, I need you. And I, my husband's in the shower. I freaking like storm, the, storm open the door. I'm like, get out of the shower. He's like, like literally like open the things. And he's like wet and like, what's happening? I'm like, something's wrong with Mel. Brandon says he needs us. Cause you guys don't ask us for a lot. So if someone's asking us to go, it's like, you know, I, I feel you mean it. Um, so from my perspective, you know, and what he had told me, he literally used the words, I don't think she's going to make it. And I was like, what are we talking about? It, we had some banding for a hemorrhoid. Like I remember being like overwhelmed with the confusion of it all. And I'm sure you were as well, but maybe you can tell us like what, how we got to that point. Like what was it that mm -hmm. made him call me? 
Yeah, so he was actually um, not at the hospital the whole night. He let me sort of sleep, and well, he actually wanted sleep himself, which was mm. fine. And we thought that I was, I was stable and I wasn't bleeding. So, he, so we hours of the morning, um, he's not there, but I get that same sensation, and I get the nurse to take me to the bathroom, and more blood is coming out, and that continued. That was that was about five a.m. I got back to the bed. I just remember grabbing the nurse's hand, and I was shaking, and I and I just I remember calling out to her, just being like, "Tell me what's going on. What is happening with my body? You're so confused, and in such a like a moment of desperation, and you just you don't know what to do." So I got back to the bed. And I called my husband. I said, you need to get back here. I knew, I knew things were going south pretty quickly. So fortunately, he got back to the hospital in enough time because that bleeding was like a faucet. It had, just, it had opened up and it was just nonstop. It was like opening and closing and opening and closing. And the sensation was coming and going. Um, the reason why I was, in, uh, I was in actually a place called the Field Hospital, which is part of the hospital, but it's an overflow part for COVID. Um, so it was sort of like makeshift. But I was being held there because it was a long weekend and I was scheduled for a colonoscopy that was supposed to take place on the Tuesday, mm -hmm. right? I was admitted on the Sunday night. Now we're here Monday morning. I have a whole sort of 24 hours I have to go through of bleeding mm -hmm. just to get to that colonoscopy. So I had my mind set on that. But in that moment, I was like, how am I going to get there? And I need to keep, I need to keep standing up for myself and I need to keep being heard. So I was asking every nurse that came by, I want to speak with a doctor get me in touch with the doctor. They would have some doctors come by who were checking my blood work, going over everything. It was dropping. So my blood work now went from you know 122, which is still stable. Now we're down to 98. And at the last moment when they checked it, which was about 81, um, they presented me with papers to sign for doing a blood transfusion. And to do a blood transfusion, I mean, they, they mandate it basically at 70, when your hemoglobin gets to 70, mm -hmm. that it's mandated that they, at this hospital, that you have to do it. I don't know if that's a province-wide thing. Um, but, it, you know, you're getting the papers. There's risk to that as well. But you're thinking, okay, this is going south so quickly. Nobody knows what's going on. I, I've got to do this. I have no choice. So we sign the papers. Um, here we are getting the blood transfusion, so one bag. But at the same time, I'm also drinking a solution for anybody who's done a colonoscopy before. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of prep involved, mm -hmm. and you have to evacuate the system. You have to clear the system. Well, mm -hmm. here am I thinking, I'm already evacuating the system. Like, how much more do I have to do to do, you know, yeah. to do this? And I remember speaking to the nurse and saying, I don't feel comfortable with this. But again, you're faced with that. This is authority, and here yeah. you are, and you're trying to voice your opinion, you're saying, I don't want any more to come out of this area. I don't want anything to aggravate it. But of course you do it. So I take the solution and pretty much after that, and while I still have the transfusion in, um, the blood loss is coming and it's so great that I have my first um, crash. I call it a crash because they did call code blue mm -hmm. um, when I was in the field hospital. And my husband was there. I remember Again, it was like in and out of consciousness, but for the most part there, and what I felt like I was, I was present, um, you know, you're following your breath, you're just trying to stay, you know, I guess alive, and nurses are just scrambling, they're all around, and I know they called the ICU team to mobilize and come up and get me, and now I'm like, okay, things are moving. Yeah. We're moving in the right direction. At least, <laughs> At least I'm get not sitting here. Get, get me out of this field yeah. hospital. Get me to somebody who knows what, what's going on, right? Um, so I'm being transported to the ICU. Here I am in the ICU. This is, I guess, That's now, where I showed up. Probably. The moment yeah. where you got that phone yeah. call. Um, so I'm in a room. Uh, after the fact, I, I found out that I was just in the ICU room. And nurses are trying to get lines in. They can't. There's commotion. I think doctors are outside talking to my husband, mm -hmm. talking to you guys. Um, and I start crashing again. I think it was a... That's the one that I heard bit. over the PA. Right. Like code blue, code blue. And they say the room, which is obviously, you know, for people... There was no one else in the waiting room. Like, we mm. knew it, who it was, right? Um, but no one comes to tell you anything. It wasn't until, like, five minutes later that a nurse comes in and just you know, is explaining to us what's going on. And obviously you're the one living it. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, you know, the doctors came and they were like, 
there's three of us here now, so obviously finally they, they got the doctors back from whatever holiday they were on trying to, to have. Right. Um, you know, and all these things take time to get all the pieces together. They had a general surgeon, they had a, uh, the guy called himself the butt doctor, <laughs> and they had a GI tract doctor as well. And they were like, we're gonna essentially go up in there mm -hmm. and we're gonna try to figure this out. And depending on who's, what, what needs to be done, we have all the doctors here. Mm -hmm. That was what mm -hmm. was told to us. And, but, but they needed Brandon to sign off on putting an IV through your leg because uh, not an IV, the transfusion, transfusion because you weren't getting enough in through your arms. That's right. Right? That's right. Yeah, I do remember that vividly. I mean, I was awake through the whole procedure. Um, they couldn't sedate me because of uh, the fact that I wasn't stabilized. Um, they couldn't even move me to a surgical room, so yeah, they, they did everything right. Yeah, they made your the room the OR. That's right. Essentially. Yeah, yeah. So I know at one point, you know, you go, Brandon goes through that, I guess I need to tell her parents and we need to switch, you know, we need to get them here. That's when obviously my husband and I left to go take care of your kids. They were already sleeping, thankfully. Luckily on our way there, we get the phone call from Brandon being like, the procedure's done. She's stable now. Mm -hmm. Still no real answers, but at least, but at least we were told that you were stable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't know really where to take this. Obviously, well, maybe you can tell the viewers and the listeners like what actually was the problem because they, they, they got right. you stable. Then they were giving you a lot of blood. I think I remember hearing that you had eight units of blood transfused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The average human has about 10 units of blood. So you essentially lost 80% of all of your blood. Well, and actually after the fact, I found out from a doctor, um, another doctor, that that's average person and for our and size. You're not, I know, that's an tiny, average human. So technically our size is actually five 100%. to six units. So I got almost So like one in a than, bit. Yeah, yeah. Of, so like, of so loss. pretty big deal. Like, mm -hmm. like yes. literally every ounce of blood in your body needed to be replaced and some. What did, like, what did they say it was? Just so people can like say, you know, understand sure. fully what had happened. So that hemorrhoid band um, essentially caused the issue. So the band had eroded and uh, eroded too soon uh, for my for my rectal artery to be able to close up on its own. So that band essentially disappears, and now we've got a gaping artery, artery gaping hole, right? Because um, the hemorrhoid, I guess. I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but that's basically what I was told. And I wasn't clotting. And maybe that's because of the size of the hole. Again, they don't really know. They're still trying to understand what had happened. This is a one in a million case. I think it's even worse. It has it, to be like, worse it, than that. Because if right. it was a hundred, one in a million case, they would have put on the potential problems that might arise. That would have been one of them. They said some right. bleeding. Right. They never said, oh, you might need a full body blood transfusion. Right. That might be one of the problems. You know what I mean? That's right. So obviously you were bleeding. I think what was most interesting is that they said that the blood was kind of going, instead of just directly coming out, it, w it was going into your cavity almost. That's right. Into, and it was essentially rotting. That's, and yes. that now that's why, you know, the smell and everything, because it was like old, old blood that was like coming out with the gas and everything. That's right. Um, I want to circle back because we also found out that taking the Tylenol, uh, the Advil mm -hmm, mm -hmm. was a problem as well, right? That's right. Yeah. So I'll, I'll circle back to that and, and touch on also like just a bunch of things along the way that were sort of telltale signs. And again, this isn't, I, I just want to, you know, express that this is not me speaking ill of our healthcare system. Our, our medical system is fantastic here in Canada. I think we can all agree on that. I think people go through experiences and some people have other viewpoints about it, but at the end of the day, in the grand scheme of things, where we live mm -hmm. is pretty good, mm -hmm. right? But there are things that go wrong, and doctors are people too. We all make mistakes, right? They are absolutely credible. They've gone to school. They have the years of experience. They've seen it, right? We put our trust in them. But at the same time, you also know your body best. And there, everybody has that little voice. Everybody has that intuition inside of them. It's bubbling, and you have to listen to that, right? At the beginning, I was told to take ibuprofen and Tylenol. Mm -hmm. You're actually not supposed to take ibuprofen. I found out afterwards of other colon surgeons who were around the hospital who were surprised that I was, I was told I was able to take ibuprofen. When you go in for a procedure, whether it's a colonoscopy or hemorrhoid banding or anything, they actually say to remove that, mm -hmm. to stop taking it. But they didn't say that. They didn't you. say it. They actually kept saying it over and over again each time I went back into the clinic. 
and I was saying I'm in pain, and again, I was told to keep taking it, keep taking it, right? So that's the, that's the first thing. I don't know whether that, um, so I should also make note, the ibuprofen actually stops you from clotting, and it thins your, breath, your blood. So that's why they want you to stop taking ibuprofen. Yeah, like, I think it's almost like every surgery, like, right. they don't, don't want you to take it. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So here I am, you know, you're just putting your trust in them, so you take it. So that's, that's, that's the first thing. We don't know 100% why this occurred, but all these little things along the way. Um, but a few other little things that came up, again, you know, going into Emerge and speaking up for myself and not taking no for an answer and again, listening to that inner voice and advocating for myself. I did that with the Emerge doctor. Um, I did that again with the Emerge surgeon who presented me with the option. And I was quite surprised I'm being presented, but again, I, you know, you don't know why there are reasons why they do things. Um, but again, I, I stood up for myself, and I, I, I said, no, this isn't, this isn't right. I, ne I need to be admitted. So that was another thing. The other thing, which I, I do wish I did more of, but I was so weak, was in the hospital when I was bleeding. Mm -hmm. Bleeding profusely and waiting and waiting and waiting and having that colonoscopy being like the end goal that I just needed to get to. I just needed to stay alive just to get to that colonoscopy the next day, and that was slowly slipping away from me. Like every time I was bleeding more and more and more, I was not getting close enough to, to that day. And I kept asking the nurses, you know, over and over again for more. There was, I don't know, there was only so much that they could do. Honestly, looking in their eyes, they were fearful of what was going on. And you're looking to them for answers and they, they have, have none. no idea what's going on. So that's really scary. And you know, you're kind of, you're stuck, right? Like, you're you're not, you're immobile and you're very weak and now here you are trying to fight for your life fight and fight it. for yourself exactly which is interesting. exactly um i came and stayed with you at the at the hospital overnight we had a great conversation i wonder if there's you know for people who are listening obviously we're saying like guys you need to advocate for yourself you need to if something doesn't feel right in your life you need to go out and get it. And I was saying like that, you know, you can apply that to your career too. Like mm -hmm. if you think that you deserve something, no one's gonna fight for you. No one's gonna stand up for yourself. You have to kind of like take the bull by the, the horns in a way. And particularly when it comes to your health, particularly when it gets to no answers. Um, we've I've talked to, to many people about infertility and that's a, another thing I hear often is, no, you need to go and seek the answers. These things aren't gonna come to you. Um, and we always assume that the healthcare is there to help us, but that, you know, sometimes, they got a lot going on. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's your life, it's your body. You need to, to stand up for what you think. Was there any like big aha moments for you? Cause I feel like the average person doesn't necessarily go through a life or death situation like mm -hmm. you did, like real, multiple times where clearly, you know, them calling code blue mm -hmm. is that can go one of two ways that you would like to share with anybody that like you kind of feel we can maybe learn through your experience. Yeah, I mean, aside from, from advocating for yourself, um, like post everything, for me, really, I mean, when you're sort of, you when, I guess when you're on your deathbed and you're, you know, you're having that moment where you're here in this world and you're quickly fading and you're, you're going somewhere else, um, as soon as you become stable enough to, and you're given the second chance, right, to keep living, for me is like presently living every day, honestly. And I know it sounds so cliche, and I know there's a lot of people out there that have been through um, traumatic experiences, um, they've been sick, you know, uh, experiences where they fought for their life. Um, and sometimes you just need to hear stories over and over and over again for it to really, really sink in. I know for me, I take a lot from what I see when I, I, I love listening to people's stories and I really absorb them and I try my hardest to take little messages from everybody and apply that to my life. And I don't know, maybe this will be the moment for somebody out there today to look at that and go, oh my goodness, I'm facing this right now. She just gave me this, you know, this ability and this power. But for me, like before I was running around with my head cut off every day well, you certainly <laughs> trying to manage like everything you, you certainly didn't look at she's like the calmest <laughs> mother like you got your shit down oh. pat but i don't know what's happening on the inside but certainly on the outside yeah yeah, yeah. Like i'm like running thing. i'm like i'm like a little duck i'm like yeah. paddling 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 and i think we can all relate to that and i love it i love what what i do i do love being a mom but you know you're you're doing a million and one things and sometimes i was just missing stuff i was missing 
I was miss I want to say like breathing. I was missing just breathing and taking it in and mm. just taking a moment. And for me coming out of this, I'm trying to take a step back. I'm trying to slow down a bit. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to listen um, more to I, I listen very well to myself, but I'm listening really, really well to to everything that my body needs and what I need, right? I think is so important um, because without your health, like you have nothing, mm -hmm. you know. So I would say that, and um, and just getting out and doing things, just doing them. And what and it's funny. I know you said I think a few days ago, just go out and do it. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I listen to that, and I'll I'll take that. I'll I'll snag that because. There are so many times in a day prior to this moment that I had where I would say, oh, I'm going to get to that. Oh, I'm going I'm to write that down. I'm going to do that. Or I, you know, I lay in bed and I'm writing my, my to-do list you know, constantly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that. I'm gonna, I'll do that another time. And I just think we all do that. And you have no idea, like, you know, if the rug is going to get pulled out from under you, yeah. right? At any given moment. I am a healthy 38-year-old. Um, for the most part, I've had small, minor things, right? We, I think everybody's had a run-in at some point, whether it's you, your family, a relative that has had a run-in with um, a health scare, you know? At some point, you will. It's just life. It happens, right? But when it happens, my God, like... It, it, it shapes it you up a bit. It you, yeah. It makes it sound like, you know, all the daily tasks, the things that become the most important that we make most important every day, they actually should almost be the least important. Mm -hmm. It's like those big mm -hmm. things. Like, I want to start a new career. I want to start, I, I had somebody who's been calling me who's like, Laura, I want to start a blog. I don't know how. But it's like, but all the little things in life get in the way of doing that one big thing. And it's almost like we have it like flipped because, mm -hmm. you know, I, we always say like, if something's in front of your face, you have to move it. So it's like, I have to make the kids breakfast. Like you have to do these, all these little things. But oftentimes those little things can be in the way of you like really doing something that makes you feel fulfilled or enjoying the moment and being present. And um, so I think we can all learn from that. What it, what's next for Mel? I know that um, you talked to us a little bit about maybe going back to work come September-ish, maybe, <laughs> maybe. I just was curious, you know, does this make you recalibrate that? Um, timelines maybe have changed? Because I, I feel like a lot of women and men, but, you know, let's call a spade a spade, it's mostly women who are staying home with their kids and who take um, time off from work, mm -hmm. from their careers. Um, and they, they're faced with this moment of like, do I go back? Does it make sense to go back? Do the finances make sense? Does my spouse or partner feel I should? And how do I navigate that? So I'm curious, maybe you can just touch on that sure. a little bit and, and what your thoughts are around that. Sure. Well, it's, um, yeah, it's ironic that you're asking me about that because I'm presently in that headspace right now. Um, and I know we've, we've touched on that. So my youngest is going back to, is going to school, starting school. So she, I've got a JK and a grade one entering in the fall. Um, I want to say empty nester, but that's not, I can't use that term yet. <laughs> oh, not quite, not quite. <laughs> not, not quite, not quite. Um, Maybe between still the hours of blank and blank, you're an empty nester. Yes, yes. But um, I mean, my husband and I have been chatting very, um, you know, personally about this issue. And I... <sighs> I struggle with this. It's such an internal um, battle that I'm having. So on one side of it, you have, you know, the financial um, aspect of it, right? Um, you've got, for me, I've got my husband who is the um, financial provider in our household, and I'm not a financial provider. I do pro I provide value in other ways. I am a full time mom, and I manage our household. So mm -hmm. every day to day gets done by me. Um, so I, I do believe I'm providing a lot of value in, in that respect. But then you also have that internal battle of like, am I providing enough value? How much is his value more than mine? Because he's bringing in a financial you know, side to it and I'm not, right? I'm not contributing financially to this family. So that's, that's one thing. And then the other thing is, is guilt. Um, I felt that... I would say a little bit before when I was making my decision of, of exiting the workforce when I was having kids. Um, and that's guilt that I um, won't be the best version, best mom that I can be to my kids mm -hmm. if I go to work, right? 
and I have to now share and spread my attention. And that's something that I really struggle with because I'm sort of an all or nothing kind of person. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, I can attest to that, yes. Right? If Mel's gonna do something, it's gonna be it's, very, it's very, gonna very, well. very, very well. It's gonna be very, very well, 100%. It's not that I can't multitask, I can multitask, I think, better than, than, than a lot of people. Um, but I'm, when I'm passionate and I'm doing, like for work, I have to do it 100% here. If I'm a mom, I have to do it 100%. And I couldn't, that was also a reason why I felt like my space was being a full-time mom. And I felt it very, very difficult and, and, and why I decided to go down that, that other route. So that's where I'm struggling on that side. And then the other side, it's like, well, if I don't enter the workforce, my kids are looking to me like I'm a female role model for them. And I have two girls. And, you know, I'm already starting to get the questions, why isn't mommy working? Oh, interesting. Why, yeah, so I'm getting that from, from our eldest. Right? So that's, that's hard too. So I feel like it's pending. Is the decision kind it's of pending? We're not sure. It's, well, <laughs> if you ask my husband, that would be a little bit different story. The decision's story. done. I think the decision's <laughs> done in that, well, here's the thing. Financially, Don't worry, he doesn't have to listen to this part. <laughs> There's a, lot, there's a lot of things that we want, goals that we have, and in order to get to them, I think we, we know we need two financial contributors to the household. Mm -hmm. that's, just, that's just what we need. But then right? you also have to take into consideration, like, okay, if you're working full time, mm -hmm. you know, then now you have someone that has to maybe pick the kids up from school, and there's that financial component too. Right. But maybe then you're only doing part time, but then is that such financial help that it's worth it. Like it's, exactly. it's a lot and, I, and I'm glad I'm, I'm talking to you about this because I feel like you're in the midst of it and I feel so many people are always in the midst of it mm -hmm. and you never really know which way to go, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I feel mm -hmm. like just the way it felt so natural for you when you decided to stop working and it was like almost a no brainer, mm -hmm. you're going to get to a point one way or another where you, it will just feel natural. Like you Absolutely. can't force things sometimes. Yeah. You know, and we always think, well, when they go back to school and you have to have that decision made by then, but who says you have to have that decision made by then? You know, Definitely. I've talked to so many mothers on this show um, who many of them have juggled both, didn't juggle both, did neither great, did both great, you know, and they're always at different phases in their life, mm -hmm. right? And I feel like, like you said, whatever you choose to do, I know that you give it 110%. Um, and so I, you know, maybe we'll have you back one day and it will be like, we'll know the, we'll know what happened from the there story, but thank you for sharing that. Cause <laughs> I know that's personal. Mm -hmm. Anything I didn't touch on that you kind of feel this is your, you know, your, your stage. I want to make sure that you feel heard and that you feel you've got like the point across about Absolutely. anything that we've touched on today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think I'll just reiterate it again, but, um, I think oftentimes we don't want to challenge anybody who's a professional person or profession, you know, uh, someone in, in an authoritative position, right? Whether it be for your health because they're in the medical field or it's in your career or you're just at home and it's your day to day and you're having, you know, somebody come to the house who's in a professional position, tradesperson or, or whatnot, and you're nervous to speak your mind or challenge something that they're giving you, right? Because you think that that person holds all the answers mm. in their field. And I think it's so, so important to understand that you have this voice and you have the ability to speak up and we need to use that, right? You need to feel confident enough to, to be able to do that because in my situation, if it's health related, at the end of the day, it honestly could just save your life. You know, I know um, ultimately it was uh, the medical field that saved my life, right? But in order to give myself... Isn't it ironic? Sorry, because they, I, I, I'm totally interrupting because okay. like they got you into that mess, but they right. also got you out. Got me out of it, right? right? And I think it was also me. It was a partnership. It's a, it's a physician and a patient partnership that went hand in hand that allowed me to get to that point of even being able to fight for my life. Because if I was sent home, you know, I had so many doctors say to me, I can't even imagine what would have happened. And, and just to touch on that, when I was in the recovery, um, stage of everything. I had a lot of um, physicians come and visit me, ones that didn't even work on me just because my story had spread so quickly throughout the hospital. And when they, when they did come, I heard a lot of them say, I am so thankful you did what you did and, and you listened to your gut and you stood up, you know, for yourself essentially, because you know, they, they're actually welcoming it, believe it or not. You might think that this is sort of taboo and they're, 
not going to be hush okay hush. with this and it's hush hush right like I did um, go public and, and post my story on on my platform and I had a physician who wrote and that was the first time hearing it outside of, of my situation say to me thank you for doing that because I try to do that in my practice mm. and I try to follow my gut and I hope that the patient will do the same you know it's so interesting the original doctor who came to say you can leave and then got you in touch with the other surgeon. Mm -hmm. I believe it was her who came back, right? That's right. Because she realized had she got had she sent you home and you didn't say anything, you wouldn't have had time with what had happened to get back to the hospital. That's right. So you wouldn't have survived essentially. And she came back, I think obviously feeling quite sheepish, but also mm -hmm. now learning. And she said, you know, I've dug more into your file. You know, these doctors mean well, they get into their career because they want to save people's lives things happen, right? And so, you know, kudos to them for like coming back and like admitting it and saying like, I went back and I reviewed your file and I would have done things differently and they can always learn. It's funny, I, I was listening to a Jordan Peterson podcast the other day and Jordan Peterson said, um, you know, if you're, if you're sending your kids to school and there's these rules at school, you know, a lot of people say, listen to the teacher. You know, that's I think where it starts in life, like listening to authority, like listen to the teacher. And Jordan Peterson said, said, I don't tell my kids to like go to school or he didn't and like listen to everything the teacher says. Understand that like everything can be considered good or bad and you have to determine for yourself if you think it's right or wrong and just understand that if you don't want to go along with something that there might be repercussions and there might be consequences that are bad to you but don't just go along with things for the sake of going along with them. And I think that's um, a great place to start. It's, it's in our kids mm -hmm. learning how to speak up for themselves. So. Thank you for sharing your story. I so appreciate it. And obviously, I'm even more appreciative that you're freaking here to tell the story because it was obviously a very traumatic time for our family. And uh, we, of course, love you so much. And I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful you. that this story can, you know, maybe help save some other people along the way. So thanks. Absolutely. Thank love you, you for having me. Love you. See you next time.